CTV News at 5 with Hudson Mack. Two men from North Saanich are facing charges of animal cruelty. Dave and Dennis Bocott were charged after a female goat was found lying in their yard, too weak to stand, covered with dry fecal matter with severe injuries to its leg. A necropsy revealed that the goat was starving and suffered from bronchopneumonia and a parasite infection. The men are scheduled to make their first appearance in court in Victoria on the 15th of this month. Well, the federal government has now taken control of the public funding, taking it out of the hands of the Attawapiskat First Nation in northern Ontario. An emergency housing crisis was declared in that community of 1,800 people about a month ago. The Red Cross arrived on Tuesday to help some families living in tents as temperatures were plummeting to minus 20. The MP for Vancouver Island North, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister John Duncan, has ordered a full audit to see where all of the money that has been spent on the reserve over the past five years. The issue is the main topic in the House of Commons today, with Duncan fending off criticism from the opposition over his ministry's handling of the situation. Where is his plan long term to get this community out of this disgraceful level of poverty? On November the 7th, we got our first funding proposal from Ottawa Piscat First Nation. On November the 8th, we approved 500000 immediately to be used for some housing renovations. We responded quickly. On Thursday, November the 24th, we got an emergency declaration from Ottawa Piscat. And on November the 28th, Monday, my officials were in the community. That's why we appointed a third-party manager, Mr. Speaker. Duncan says placing the community under third-party management is the strongest form of intervention that's available to Ottawa. Opposition MPs blame Duncan for failing to act quickly with the housing crisis, calling him incompetent. Prime Minister Stephen Harper met with the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Sean Atlio, in Ottawa this afternoon to discuss the issue. They have agreed to an emergency summit of First Nations leaders on Applewaterscat uh, early next year. Well, friends and family and former colleagues gathered in Victoria today to celebrate the life of Andy Stephen, the veteran broadcaster who died last month. It was during the 1950s, 60s and 70s that he became well known throughout Vancouver Island as well as the lower mainland and eventually the entire province. But he loved Victoria where he caught his first salmon and was able to golf all year round. His epitaph is simple. Life has held many humorous moments for me. This is not one of them. <laughs> Andy Stephen was remembered for his sense of humor and as a pioneer in broadcast journalism in Victoria. He was the city's first television news anchor, while he was also news director at CKDA Radio. He opened the door of the Legislative Press Gallery for electronic journalists as one of the gallery's first radio and TV reporters. And his political reporting over the years was known across the province on his long-running program, Capital Comment. And he was also remembered for his love of fishing and, of course, for that booming baritone voice. Andy Stephen was 84. And the mustard seed is decking the halls with Christmas cheer, launching a campaign today that will help the less fortunate this holiday season. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! The town crier kicked off the event, and the Vic High Choir was providing the music at the 13th annual Spirit of Giving campaign in support of the mustard seed. The goal again this year is to raise money for the nonprofit organization and to give people a warm meal this Christmas. Organizers say every year they are thankful for all of the support. The one thing I think they need to know about is that Victoria supports the work of the mustard seed and we're so very grateful. Not just the businesses, uh, not just the base centre, which is very significant, but the community at large. So we just um, implore people, uh, please come alongside and support the work that we do because it's the work of your hands that we are contributing to to eradicate poverty in our city. Since 1999, the Bay Centre has supported the Spirit of Giving campaign. Over the years, more than $2 million in food and cash donations has been raised for the mustard seed. If you'd like to help and make a donation, you can go to the Bay Centre at level two. And jolly old St. Nick uh, came rolling into town a little early today, making a special stop ahead of schedule. Oh, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, Santa went back to school, dropping by the University of Victoria this afternoon in a one-horse open carriage. Mr. Claus and his little helpers were giving out uh, horse-drawn carriage rides to students around the UVic campus. The North Pole crew was also handing out candy canes and hot chocolate and cookies outside the library. 
What brings me to UVic is uh, my opportunity to spread the joy and the meaning of Christmas. In all these older students, no matter what you see out there, you can find the oldest person, and inside that person beats the heart of a seven-year-old. Well, we were bringing some uh, holiday cheer to the campus. It's a stressful time for the students with doing, uh, they've got exams on right now, and, and it's, it's, it's time for everybody to kick back and relax, have a little fun, and, and feel the joy of Christmas. It is the second year that Santa's dropped by UVic to spread holiday cheer before students fan out and head home for the holidays. Well, they flipped the switch at the B.C. Legislature about an hour ago, lighting the giant sequoia on the lawn, and they did the same thing in capital cities across the country tonight at the legislative and parliament buildings across the country. They're twinkling tonight with Christmas lights. One, light up, That was the scene at dusk tonight. The parliament buildings in Victoria and the sequoia all lit up for the holiday season. The 34-meter tree on the front lawn now is blazing with 2,500 LED lights lighting up the night. Well, the city of Nanaimo has begun the process of seeking an injunction against the Occupy Nanaimo protesters who are still camped out in Diana Crawl Plaza. The city went to court this morning after a 9 a.m. deadline passed for the occupiers to leave the plaza voluntarily. The city says it'll now await a court ruling on the protest. It could be a bylaw infraction notice that might be handed out. Um, and then the next steps beyond that, um, I think, are just going to unfold as they do. I, I don't know that uh, there'll be any great changes or plans that we can differ on at the city level. And, and uh, Matt and I think Occupine and Imo have got their positions that they support, and we respect that. The Occupy movement appeared to grow in the Nanaimo today with significantly more people crowding into Diana Crawl Plaza, but one of the leaders of the group says that it's been strong right from the start. It's just that the supporters made a point of being there in person today because of the city's deadline. We have our occupation, obviously, where, where people occupy, but there's so many people who aren't able to come down here all the time. You know, they have families, they have jobs, you know, they have responsibilities, day-to-day -day lives, and um, they, uh, they help out in other ways, whether it's, you know, cooking food to bring down for us, whether it's, you know, working on the web team, whether it's outreach with other community associations. The Nanaimo's Occupy group says it will move, but only if the city provides the protesters with a new place to set up. The city's not agreed to do that. The injunction application will be heard next Friday morning in a Nanaimo courtroom. Employees at the Harmac Mill in Nanaimo are celebrating a milestone, their first dividend checks as part owners of the company. It was three years ago that the workers at Harmac thought they were unemployed and out of options. The mill was owned by Pope and Talbot, and the company was in serious financial trouble, so it was shutting Harmac down. That's when the workers decided to buy the mill themselves and did so with help from some big investors. And today the risk paid off. 2008, we're in very stressful times. You lose your job at the age of 50 years old and you, uh, you don't know what you're going to do in your future. And, and an opportunity comes along to become not only a, an employee again, but an owner. You know, I'm a fourth generation, I'm third generation Harmac. My children work here as students, as well as my father and my grandfather. So for us to go through and start this up again is just, just a fantastic opportunity. And for it to be a success, you know, many of the analysts wrote Harmac off as a dead issue and for us to watch it resurge and come back to life and be a positive influence going forward. Some of the workers say they thought they might have been throwing their money away when they made their original investment in Harmac, but they didn't know what else to do. You know, we really had no choice at our age. You know, we had to try something and we did and it's worked out for the better. The first year was a real struggle. We, you know, we barely survived and, uh, you know, the last two years, uh, you know, the price of pulp went up and, and that, of course, really helped and it sent us on our way and and uh, hopefully it'll it'll stay that way and, uh, you know, we'll just continue on from there and grow grow larger. 300 workers received their dividend checks today. The checks were for several thousand dollars each. Also in Nanaimo, the Salvation Army is feeling a lack of Christmas spirit this year. A decline in volunteers is leaving the kettle campaign so far pretty much high and dry. The Sally Ann says its kettle campaign numbers have fallen far behind last year's. After just one week, this year's campaign is $7,000 below the first week in 2010. The Salvation Army says the biggest problem is a lack of volunteers. There are high traffic locations where there's no one to man the kettles. So we have lots of empties, and the money this year so far is a little bit low as well, but that's because we don't have the kettle shifts manned. We would love for people to come on board to man the kettles. We have, on average, about 20 locations a day unmanned, and it's two and a half hours in length, or the last shift is about two and a half to three hours. So we would love to be people, have people calling and making our lines ring all day long. 
If you would like to volunteer, you can reach Don Anderson of the Salvation Army in the Nanaimo. Her number is 250-740-1004. Now the students at Mount Prevost Middle School in North Couch and are well on their way to raising $50,000 to build five schools in five countries. The middle school students took on the fundraising challenge from Victoria entrepreneur Taylor Conroy. He put up $5,000 out of his own pocket to challenge the students to take that money and turn it into $50,000. Well, after just six weeks, their efforts are paying off. They have turned that $5,000 into twelve, and that's enough money already to build one school. It's pretty special. You feel like after you got one down, you feel good, and then when you get two down, you feel r really good. And then once you get five down, we're all just going to be so relieved we don't have to fundraise anymore. <laughs> it makes you feel really good because we've been we've been growing up and living in a place that's so privileged to get your education, and other places haven't really had that uh, ability. From wristbands to talent shows and grocery bags, the kids have come up with some unique ways to raise the money. What I didn't expect was the other kids that have been engaged and have been brought into it. Kids who um, maybe even are struggling themselves. This is not a, a wealthy area uh, of Duncan. We are working families and uh, all those sorts of things that are happening right now, recession-wise, and yet the kids are stepping up and they're engaged and they're interested. And if they're not able to give a lot themselves, they're coming to me with ideas. The schools will be built by the charity Free the Children in Haiti, Kenya, Sierra Leone, China, and India.